April meeting of the North Miami Community Redevelopment Agency Advisory Committee. Can we begin with a roll call, please? Ms. Coble. Here. Ms. Cohen. Here. Mr. Each. Here. Ms. Estime Irvin had not confirmed. Ms. Geimer had confirmed, so I'm assuming she's running late. Mr. McDermott. Present. Mr. Reynolds had also confirmed, so I'm assuming he's running late. Mr. Sanchez. Here. Ms. Couch. Here. Mr. Gentil. Here. We have quorum chair. Okay. All right. Can we have all please uh, do the pledge of allegiance? Mr. Chair, before we continue, I just want to introduce Mr. Aaron Epstein. He's standing in for Mr. Zelkowitz. He also works for Fox Rothschild. <laughs> so he's our attorney for tonight. Okay. Okay. Um, agenda item number one. To approve the minutes. Yeah. Oh, approve the minutes of uh, the March meeting. Aye. Second. Second. Any discussion? Any corrections? All in favor say aye. 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 Yes, as you uh, remember, we had um, the CRA in partnership with CPND, the Community Planning and, and Development Department. We felt it was necessary to do an analysis of the housing situation in the city. Um, to that end, um, we hired the housing expert at FIU, Dr. Murray, who did an analysis. We did do, I think, one or two community meetings. I think it was one community meeting where he did um, show his preliminary data and now he is presenting his final report he's doing a presentation um, and he has recommended strategies we did ask him to help us prioritize how our funding should be you know prioritized for the next few years coming up because right now as you recall we've been funding single-family rehabs for the past few years mm -hmm. um, so based on his um, recommended uh, strategies, we're gonna implement those. Once you recommend approval, we will implement those as part of our budget process. Okay. So Dr. Ned Murray is here. Should I work from here? Or just no, no, you can stand right oh, here. Really? Yeah, edit the, oh, oh, I see. Okay. the <laughs> clicker. Oops, sorry. Big screen as well. Yeah, he's gonna change it. He's gonna put it right there. There, there you go. Oh, great. A lot of angles. That's fine. <laughs> Although the board only gets to see one angle, I guess. That's, That's fine. <laughs> um, okay, well, good evening and, and thank you, Rasha. Uh, you know, my pleasure to be here and my and our pleasure certainly uh, at the FIU Metropolitan Center to be able to work with the, the, the city of North Miami and the CRA and the community uh, who've who've engaged us uh, uh, in the planning process um, on this, uh, you know, important, important study. And <clears throat> as Rasha has mentioned, it's, um, it, it's, it's more than just an analysis. Obviously, the analysis, the data provides the underpinnings for the recommendations that Ra Rasha referred to. Um, and it's those uh, strategy recommendations. Okay. And it's those strategy recommendations that w that bring together both the housing, the housing uh, aspects of the plan, with the economic development aspects, which really makes this plan, you know, rather unique. Because often, as, as you all know, we do housing studies, we do transportation studies, we do economic development studies, but rarely do you get to do a housing study and an economic development study and do it together so that so that the community can really understand the, the relationship between housing and the economy and jobs. Uh, and that also gets into a number of other issues that, that we'll get into as well. So the data that we've presented uh, in the past, uh, we've updated a lot of that data, uh, which was, as I said, pr provides the underpinnings for the, uh, for the uh, uh, economic and housing policies and programming uh, for the city and the CRA, um, and also, uh, 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 the level of analysis, which is uh, very important because uh, <coughs> obviously North Miami, like a lot of cities in 
in Miami-Dade and even in Broward for that matter have fairly large geographies, so it's, 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 there's a lot of differences from from one section of the city to another. So we drill down to right to the census tract level. Uh, so we do comparisons at the city level, at the CRA level, and, and then within census tracts within the CRA itself, so sub-markets within the CRA itself, and then of course at the, at the city level we're comparing you as a, from a benchmark standpoint with Miami-Dade County as a whole. Um, with the way we approach a, um, um, a, a housing and for that matter an economic study, my background is actually is economic development. I, I know we've, we've done a lot of housing market studies in Miami-Dade and South Florida the last 15 years, uh, but my background really is economic development. I used to be a city planner with, and with development background, but obviously the housing market be, being such an integral part of the local economy in South Florida over the past 15 years, we saw what happened in 2005, 2007, and we know what happened to the housing market, and we know what happened subsequent to the crash of the bubble and, and the economic recession. So I think we all kind of were schooled 10, 12 years ago on how a housing market does impact a local economy or even a regional economy in the case of South Florida. So the first thing we look at are the demand factors. We, when we think of housing, uh, like, like a lot of economies, we think of housing supply and demand, right? And it's demand factors don't, that don't get a, a, enough attention sometimes because it's demand that really drives the market. And of course, a lot of demand in South Florida in general, and particularly in Miami, city of Miami, is, is external. It's demand coming from other parts of the world. It, it's, it's certainly not local residents for the most part. Here, in, here in, uh, in North Miami, that's a little bit different, but it's still important to understand what is driving the market. What, <coughs> What are your residents looking for? What are prospective residents for? What are businesses looking for? Uh, that's th those are the demand factors from an economic standpoint we want to be able to really comprehend <coughs> because ultimately when we get into the supply aspects of the, of the analysis, it makes a lot more sense once we under if we can fully understand what, what, the, what the key demand factors are. So on the demand side, obviously you're going to look at population, population growth in particular. Um, the city of North Miami is growing. Uh, it's not growing as fast as Miami-Dade County, but it has grown 5.7 percent since, since two, 2010. Where, where you've lost um, um, a population group is with families. You're, you've, let, you've got a lot less families here in North Miami than, than you had 10 years ago, uh, uh, I should say seven years ago. Um, but that's not uncommon either. Um, most of South Florida and, and Miami-Dade have lost more families and we're creating more households that are non-family related. So that's not uncommon, but it's something to be mindful of, particularly if you're a city that wants to be able to provide for families and the families of the families that live, that have been long-term residents, that's always a really important thing to think about. Can your children and grandchildren live here? Or will they be able to live here? Do you want them to live here? I mean, these are all questions that, that no. you need to ask. <laughs> um, this one here, the second one is, is, is uh, the second bullet, the median household income being that much less than a county. Um, once again, that, that's, it, it's something to be mindful of, but, uh, but the, you're right around where the city of Miami is. The city of Miami is about 30, you know, uh, 36 million. Uh, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, 36,000 uh, median household income. So, um, you know, for cities, you know, because there are a lot of the older cities, including North Miami, have a lot of residents, have a lot of elderly residents, uh, you got your median income is obviously going to be less than the county as a whole because now you're up against Doral and Coral Gables and Miami Beach and places like that. But something to be mindful of, particularly when we start thinking about who is it that we want to be able to uh, provide housing for and at what price ranges, whether it be rental or ownership. And then the last point is this poverty rate, which we brought up before, it, it's, it's, it's high for the county, it's extremely high within the city of Miami and, and, it, and in here in, in North Miami at 37.9% uh, children living in poverty compared to 27 for the county as a whole. It, once again, it's something to be, to be concerned, concerned about and something to be mindful of as, as we go forward. Other, other key market demand factors, um, 
this is a good one. This is one we always look at right off the bat is your labor participation rate. The labor participation rate, I, is, I think many of you know, is those folks, the 16 and older, who are actually engaged in the, in the job market. So either they've got a job or they're looking for a job. So at 64.4%, you're higher than the county as a whole. And we've seen other indicators that we're gonna, that I'll talk to you about as well, that shows that, that North Miami has, has an economy and has some real opportunity, some real potential as far as economic development goes, and obviously that'll impact uh, the housing strategy as well. Your population age is younger. That's always a good thing. 32.8 versus 39.3 average age uh, here. Um, your uh, under 25 population has increased by 4% uh, in, in recent years. So those are the, those are the kind of signs that, that are very, very positive when as a city is growing and, and maturing. But you don't, you don't want to leave, you don't want to have an older population for the most part. You certainly want older people, senior people, but you also want younger people. You want them to be coming here. You want them to be raising families, and you want them to be engaged in the local economy. The third bullet is um, rel relative to your, uh, uh, to your, to your educational attainment. 19.4% uh, of the city's population, 25 years of age and over, uh, have a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, and you compare it to, to the county, which is about 27.3%. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. Uh, although you do have 24.8% that do not have a high school, com high school diploma c compared to, to, the, to the county. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, you know, the good news and, and the bad news there, but, um, but encouraging news, particularly in terms of how educated your population is and, and pretty much comparative to the, to the county as a whole. Now, we turn on to the supply factors, the key su uh, housing market uh, supply factors. Your owner-occupied households have decreased by 16%, that's 1,600 owner households since 2010, while the city's renter-owner-occupied households in have increased by 16.5%, so 1,443 households. This is not unusual as, all at all at, 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 as well, given what happened in the market 12 years ago. I can show you almost any city and county in South Florida, up in Broward, Palm Beach as well. We lost a lot of ownership be because of that, and some of it's because of choice. Some people just would rather rent to be a little bit more mobile, uh, a little bit more careful. Uh, obviously, there's other reasons about that, but that's not to say that, that home ownership is not, is not a thing of the past. It's something that we need to think about and need to understand what, why would people want to own it in, in, in a market like this. And, and, uh, and what might be some of the incentives for home ownership. And, and as Rasha mentioned, you have a home ownership program right now. And given, given the, the, uh, the condition of some of your neighborhoods north and south of the downtown, you have some very, very stable, nice neighborhoods that, that really do require uh, the, the type of home ownership programs that you do have. You want to <coughs> encourage it, you want to preserve that as much as possible. Uh, the second bullet, your, your city, the city is, as a whole is comprised, largely comprised of multifamily structures, so that's 43.4%, but you also have this strong one unit detached stru uh, structures, which are your typical single family at 38.2%. So you, you're basically half and half for that, uh, for that type of housing structure. Uh, we brought this up before and we, and we got some feedback on the age of the housing stock. Your, your, con your issue relative to age, which is 67 point, uh, where 67.9%, almost 70% of your housing was built prior to 1970 and, and almost 50% over 50 years of age, it's not as dramatic as it is in other parts of Miami-Dade. Yes, it's always an I issue of concern because the older the housing stock, more deferred maintenance issues, there's more cost relative to rehab, there's preservation issues relative to that. Um, and so any type of housing preservation program, any, anything that can keep people in place who are current owners, all, obviously all this is very important, but, but for the most part, the quality of your older housing compared to the Miami Dade as a whole is far better. Uh, your, your neighborhoods, even though they're older, the condition for the most part uh, is pretty good. But obviously there is maintenance issues, there is preservation issues. Uh, but it's not like when we, we look at other neighborhoods and communities in Miami-Dade County 
where anything 50 years old or, or older is for the most part ne needs to be replaced. And that's, that's, the, that's the difference. Um, a few more market supply factors. 61.4% uh, of your renters here in North Miami are now cost burdened. Uh, cost burden, as you know, is, is means you're paying in excess of 30% of your income on rent. Uh, that's not, um, once again, that's not uncommon here in South Florida or for the country as a whole anymore. It's that 40% severely cost burden that does concern us, though, because sever what, by severely cost burden, what we're talking about um, are renters who are paying in, in excess of 50% of their income on housing costs. So that is a concern. And of course, a lot of that ties back to the median, the low, median household income, the, the poverty rate that we showed. So, so there, there are some issues there. Uh, the second bullet, the median value of an owner-occupied home in, in North Miami is, uh, this is according to the, to the U.S. Census, is 157, 900, 221 for Miami-Dade County. You can look at this as a negative, you can look at it as a positive. What we're finding is that as we do housing market studies in South Florida, um, that could be a real benefit. The fact that your homes have not appreciated, even though you get the quality that I mentioned, you've got some really quality neighborhoods with quality homes. The fact that you're that much less than the county as a whole means that you have real opportunities for, for purchase here and preservation, maybe purchase rehab, uh, but, but from what we've seen, it's the communities that didn't over-appreciate during the last cycle uh, are the communities that are much better off, and particularly if you have the quality and quantity of, of, of stable neighborhoods and, sta and a stable housing supply that the city of North Miami has. So that, I see that as really being a really optimistic uh, number right there, um, or finding, I should say. And then the last is the rents. Now, this is a real concern because this is happening everywhere. And part of it is, be, as going back to the, uh, the previous slide, the demand for rental housing, because so many more people are renting now versus owning, that is that demand supply uh, type of uh, uh, scenario that's being played out here. Vacancy rates are down uh, throughout the county, so the rents are obviously going up. So this is a concern, uh, uh, and, and particularly at the, at the, uh, at the uh, at the median household incomes that we were talking about. That has a lot to do, that 1,527 has a lot to do with that top number of 40% severely cost burden. That's a lot of money for someone to be paying out per month when you're only making 40, 30, 40,000 uh, a year. Okay. Um, it's not showing real well, is it? Um, Map's not showing the way it should. I, I don't really. Uh, this is the, this is the PDF, uh, Rasha. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know what? <laughs> Let me see if I can. If, if you want to give it a minute, I'll try. I'll load the actual PowerPoint that way. Maybe it's the PDF that's doing it. I don't know. battle with this podium before. <laughs>
that shows up a lot better. So as I mentioned uh, at the uh, outset, um, we, 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 we drilled down into the city and to the CRA in particular uh, to look at individual census tracts. And if, if you begin to look at individual census tracts, which are obviously are much smaller areas within the CRA and the city as a whole, you begin to see some real variations in terms of both the population uh, and, and the housing stock. Um, this particular um, slide, the first one gets back to the population growth, and you can see where you've, you, where you've lost most of your population. There's, there's your core right there in, in your downtown uh, census tract uh, 218, and most of your growth has been out on US 1, as you can see. That's where your highest growth, 18 to 28 percent of your population growth has occurred in some of the newer areas, of course, along, uh, along US 1. So your, your, most of your population growth has occurred um, um, uh, along there, but also um, there's, some real, there's some interesting parts of your, of your, particularly your downtown area and other areas where you've also shown some growth, seven to, eight, 17, seven to 18 percent in the green sen uh, census tract. So that's, that's uh, something to consider, but, but a large part of the CRA has, has had population loss over the last seven years. Um, we, we look at household income, um, um, and uh, as I said before, we want to compare uh, the city with the county, but we also want to compare the CRA with, with, with the city as a whole. Um, as you all know, uh, as the numbers show in that top row, most of, most of your population uh, and most of your families live within the CRA. Uh, roughly 80% of your population lives within your CRA boundaries, and you can see here what, what some of those some of those uh, 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 income groups in, uh, uh, based upon uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, or should I say income categories, uh, and, you, and at the bottom, the median household income in dollars, 37.49, once again, as I mentioned earlier, for the city of North Miami versus 44,000. The, the North Miami CRA varies. We don't have a median there because you have so many different census tracts. There's not one median you have to look at it in terms of the individual submarkets within the CRA, but as, as the uh, slides will show, there's your variations right there within, within the city and with this, within the CRA. You've got your higher incomes in, in the dark, uh, in the purplish color, I guess that's purple, uh, over to the east, which is, which is to be expected, and, and then you've got the higher, some higher incomes in, in the 308, um, uh, census tract, and your lowest incomes are found for the most part. Though that's the lightest color uh, through your C through the CRA uh, census tracts: 209, 219, 306, 1203 uh, to the south. Um, so it, it it's pretty much you know what you'd expect. Same goes for family income. The first was household. This is family. Um, once again, it's your CRA for the most part, where you see those those lower uh, household uh, uh, median median family incomes. The ranges that you can see in the box that's twenty three thousand to thirty six thousand. So that pretty much is uh, is true for all the census tracts within with, within the CRA. We also um, did another level of analysis uh, uh, for, the, for the CRA and, and for the city was to look at what we have come up with. It's, it's a model uh, that we've come up with for several years now where we actually look at distress indicators, uh, income being one of them, obviously housing issues and uh, being another, education, uh, things like that, poverty. Uh, but you can see here uh, certain, as, as it showed up in the map, you can see the median household income and the median family income in the darker, in the darker bands there, um, telling you which, which of those census tracts uh, obviously have the lowest median household incomes and the lowest median um, family incomes, and they, they pretty much line up. Um, so once again, from a, from a targeting standpoint, if you are going to look at an area that's in most need of uh, uh, programming or, or other types of policies that could improve the economy and the, hou and the housing 
uh, issues uh, in, in particular census tract as opposed to the larger CRA or the city as a whole, these would be the uh, these would be your top six census tracts uh, that that uh, have serious income issues and probably the most serious poverty issues and some of the most serious uh, cost burden issues in terms of uh, housing costs. Now, as we're doing this study, of course, we, we're being mindful of the fact that that we're talking about an economy and we're trying to put together the housing piece with the ec economic piece. This is what we, is referred to as an outflow and inflow, or sometimes an inflow and outflow analysis. What it looks at, what this analysis does, it looks at your working population, as I mentioned earlier, 16 uh, years and older, how many live and work in the city, that's the live and work number, which is 1,069, wow. how many workers come in to the city each day to take jobs in the city, but come in from other locations, that's the, yeah. that's the inflow, 11,836, and then you have your outflow. The outflow meaning residents of North Miami that get up every day and leave and from our calculations drive at least 30 minutes, mm -hmm. at least 30 minutes each, each way for their jobs. So you've got, uh, you've got a deficit there. You've got an outflow of 22,000 and you've got people coming in and you've only got 1,068 people who actually live here and work here. Now, don't feel too bad because we can show a lot of cities in Miami-Dade that look a lot like this. It has more to do with the Miami-Dade economy than it does with your economy, but it, it, what it gives you as a city, and we, we recently did a study in Doral, and Doral's numbers are much worse than this. That's one of the reasons why there's so much traffic out in Doral, and even nobody would even go near Doral during commute hours. What this provides uh, is some real opportunities, because let me tell you who's, who those people are who are leaving. A lot of those people are in education, health services. These are some of your better uh, occupations that are leaving. They're also the people who live here too. You have an, you have higher or, or more um, yeah more higher paying uh, occupations that live in in North Miami than Miami Dade as a whole. But unfortunately, a lot of them are leaving each day and going to other locations. Uh, so there's a real opportunity there. So we know if we could keep people here, great type of housing that they need because we know we got 22,000 people. I'm sorry, 11,000 people coming in. We also know people probably would like to live here as well, taking some decent jobs uh, as well. So if we can create a balance of, of housing, better access to that housing and to their jobs, now, now we can have a much more sustainable and much more resilient type of economy. So something to work with, something to understand. Who's, who's here, who's coming, who's going each day. Back to your housing inventory, as I mentioned, uh, most of your housing in the CRA uh, is is uh, um, is one is, is uh, one unit uh, detached. Uh, Twenty units or more is is, is is the other category. Thirty four point two percent. So between them, you, you're talking roughly thirteen thousand units of housing. I'm sorry, seventeen thousand in total. Uh, well, 13 in those two categories, but uh, that, that, so that's the type of housing that you'd be targeting uh, runs somewhat uh, similar to, to, the, to the city as a whole as far as you're detached. You obviously, you have less multifamily housing than the city as a whole and, and roughly in the same proportion as, as Miami-Dade County. There's the breakout by, by, by the chart once again showing you the, the big uh, or, uh, green slice is the, your one unit detached housing within your CRA and the, and the grayer uh, number showing that 34.2%. So housing mix, and, and the reason why we wanna show this, is really important, particularly if we're trying to attract people to who wanna work here and live here, or people who are currently living here and maybe looking elsewhere, getting closer to their jobs. Because remember, we got 22,000 people leaving each day We'd rather keep them here for the most part, uh, but we need to make sure that we're providing the housing and the mix of housing, the types of housing that they want. Not everybody wants a one unit de um, detached home. Not everybody wants to be living in a 20 
a unit plus apartment building. So we, 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 we gotta be thinking about that proper mix of, of housing types just as much as affordability. Affordability is critical, but housing types are too, particularly with, with a younger population who would like to be more part of a downtown, closer to their work. A lot of young people don't even own, don't want to own a car these days. So th this is important because most of your housing right now, your mix of housing is locked up in two, two categories. That doesn't give you the mix that you generally would like to have if you're trying to create a, a, a larger, more diverse uh, uh, population base. Your vacancy status, obviously, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is, is particularly on the rental side, that's what's driving a lot of the rents up. Here in, in North Miami, you can look at the first column, of course, is the CRA and then the city as a whole. Your largest uh, amount of rent, uh, vacancies fall within your rental market. That's 800, you yeah, 2,121 20, 20, in total. Uh, 810 or 32 points to, uh, percent of that are for rent vacancies. Um, and then you've got below that, for seasonal, these are your second homes, 457 units, 21.5%. You can see that jumps up at the city of Miami as a whole as you get to the units closer to the coast. And of course, you can see that figure for the county as a whole, almost 50% of the vacancies are second homes, which is obviously not uh, surprising to any of us sitting here uh, where that's all coming from. Uh, other vacant, that term, other vacant, which is 22.2% in your CRA and 28.6% in the city as a whole, higher than the county as a whole. Normally when we see other vacant, th those, those are oftentimes distressed properties. So we, 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 we probably are seeing some foreclosure activity uh, again. Uh, I know that's occurring in in, um, in a number of other cities, uh, in particularly in northern Miami-Dade County. Um, so the fact that you've got 483 units, um, you know, that are, that are of this other, other vacant category suggests that you do have distressed properties. Um, the, the rental, the rental vacancies, the 810 rental vacancies, that's a bit of a head scratch. I, we haven't figured that one out. Maybe, maybe you know, Lasha, but that, that you shouldn't have that kind of a, uh, a vacancy rate. How did we uh, come up with that number? Did we, how did we calculate so many of the vacancies, other the, vacancies? The, just the U.S. Census, census calculation, okay. yeah. And, and they were able to determine w whether that unit is a rental unit, an owner unit, uh, if they, they can they determine if it's distressed as well. You mean they knock on the door and it's open yeah. hands and they yeah. say it's vacant? Well, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, what, one of the things I see that was wrong on this in the census is the, uh, oh, you had mobile homes there. Yeah. We don't have any mobile homes in the city. There are no mobile homes in the city. Where? Where is it? Where? In the previous one. You had, you had a previous one, and I know yeah. I'm going to. Oh, 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 okay. Well, yeah, well, well, that shows up in the census. That's just, that's just a category. Yeah, there's none there. I mean, they had it down like 400 and something. And no. no. No, that's that's mobile homes. Homes. Yeah. Was it this one? Oh, yeah. 2016. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mobile homes, we don't have any in the city. Because the market has changed substantially in the last few years. What, well, Mike? There are no mobile homes. I oh, mean, yeah, right. I mean, that's the trailer true. parks are gone. There are none in yeah. the city. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's showing. Uh, uh, people live on their boats or on RVs. I don't know. That would be the zero. Yeah, I, I don't even think they're there. I, I think, it's yeah. It's the zero percent. Yeah, because what you're I seeing at 5.1 percent, the two units. I was looking through it. Yeah, at a percentage, and I'm yeah. wondering where we came out with that. Okay. <coughs> and and here's the issue I brought up earlier about the age of the residential structures. As you can see there, um, most of them were built. Uh, most of your housing stock w was built um, between 1950 and, and, and 1959. And uh, as I and as I said earlier as well. Uh, that is not as much of an issue here in the city because some of your best housing was being built around that time. Whereas a lot of the housing that was built in other parts of Miami-Dade County around that time was never meant to be permanent housing. And yet a lot of people live in there these days, whether it be Liberty City or Little Haiti or some of these other poor, poor communities. <coughs> um, and here's, so here is the, uh, the breakout by, uh, by, 
by CRA and, and, and city as a whole, um, you're, you have your neighborhoods where up north, 305, where 39 to 49% was, uh, it was built prior to 1970. And then you can see in some of the older uh, census tracts, 218, 307, 308, uh, where you have much higher percentages of, uh, of homes that were built prior to 1970. Owner occupied housing. Um, once again, the the uh, the lowest owner occupancy rates are in your CRA. Though that's the lighter color. We're 18.1 to 35.6 percent owner occupancy, and the higher the higher owner occupancy rates are, uh, are further further to the west. So, from a housing strategy standpoint, of course, we'll get into this in a couple of minutes, but. When you start to see that, when you and you know you have um, an aged housing stock, but a stable housing stock, um, it's a real opportunity, you know, to make sure that you want, that you maintain the, this, this housing because it is valuable. You got a lot of people living close to your downtown, within your CRA, uh, and we want to be able to encourage home ownership as much as possible. Here are your values, uh, owner occupied uh, home values, and here we compare uh, North Miami, uh, that's in the blue, North Miami CRA, I'm sorry. The city is in orange, and the, and the county is in the, uh, is in the purple color. Yeah, tan. Um, tan. I'm sorry? Tan. Tan. Tan, okay. Tan. <laughs> it looks purple on, on the screen. <laughs> tan, yeah. um, and you can see, once again, that, that uh, most of the CRA properties are in those first three bands you see there. Yeah. <coughs> I don't have any million dollar homes though, huh? No. Okay. No. <laughs> and, and you can see with the county they start, yeah. We, get a, we, we may CRA. have a couple there. Is that in the CRA? Yeah, it's yeah. on CRA. Uh, Can't show okay. institutional homes. But for the most no. part, um, my point. Shucks. Most, most of the CRAs Shucks. and the cities are uh, under, under $200,000, and yeah. that goes back to that. Median value that I pointed out to you earlier, which I think is 157,000. So, so that's that's your sweet point, uh, right, right about there. And here's the breakout now by um, by census tract, and of course the CRA. You're going to see some of the uh, uh, the, le the lesser priced housing within your CRA, and some of your more expensive housing. Uh, which, which came up as far as the data, 372 to 461, was obviously much further east, uh, and uh, and with pockets uh, in in other areas that certainly a little bit higher. But for the most part, most of, most of the housing ran somewhere between 68,000 and 157. Now these are your cost burden owners. We look at uh, cost burden not only in terms of the renters. As I mentioned earlier, but we also want to look at cost burden owners because if you're a cost burden owner, it's a good it's a good chance you're probably uh, elderly, uh, you're, you're probably retired, and you're paying in excess of 30 percent, and obviously you're on fixed income. So, when we look at um, some of those census tracts within the CRA, uh, and you have cost burden owners, that that is a that is a concern because we want to be able to keep owners in place. Uh, and we want to pay attention to, to the homes that they're in to make sure that those homes are preserved as well because, as I mentioned earlier, as you know, a lot of that housing is in pretty good shape. The median gross rent, um, you can see here the, the, the lower rents are in within the CRA, uh, 890 to just under $1,000 for the most part, and then your higher price rents are to the east and, and to the west where you have more... Um, uh, uh, we have new a new rental housing stock, and the cost burden renters uh, goes along pretty much with the cost burden owners. The highest levels of cost burden uh, within the CRA, uh, those those darker colors, darker greens. Uh, these are your cost burden renters, the ones that I had mentioned earlier, uh, that are paying. Uh, many of them now are paying over uh, fifty percent of their incomes on on housing costs. So. So certainly, uh, you know, 
you know, creating this more affordable rental market, particularly for your working residents and, and those who you'd want to bring here, uh, is going to be a really important uh, strategy going forward. There's the table for that, cost per owners. Once again, we do this by census tract, both uh, for owners and renters, and, and we then break it up by the severely <coughs> cost burden renters, and you can see the one, two, threes there uh, as far as the, uh, uh, as far as the uh, <coughs> severely cost burden renters, 219, 209, 306, um, you know, all well over 40%, uh, all of those <coughs> within, within the CRA. We did, then did um, a uh, affordability analysis for homeowners and for <coughs> renters based upon based upon the current median owner occupied value, which I discussed earlier, which 157.9, and the median uh, family income uh, with the MFI, which is 40,809. We also did it for the county, so you could see it in comparison, both both for the city and for the county. You can see, based upon the income, uh, those various income categories, very low income, which, which is, uh, I'm sorry, extremely low income, which is uh, 0 to 30 percent, very low, 31 to 50, low income, 51 to 80, moderate income, 81 to 100, and median, median income, 101 to 120 percent of median family income. You can see within those price, I mean, I'm sorry, within those income categories, um, the home purchase price is, is fairly minimal, um, and therefore, given given at 157,900 median uh, value, you, you see really substantial uh, gaps in terms of affordability at all. But probably the the middle income, the one, the 100, the 120 percent, which is you know somewhat reasonable, 10,009. That you know a lot of programs could address that, but anything anything more than that gets a little bit too substantial. <coughs> but you're no worse off than, than the county. In fact, in some ways, you're better off than the county because the, you can see the gaps on the right the, in red much, much higher uh, in the county because obviously you've got a much higher uh, median owner value there of 221000 and a bit of a higher um, um, uh, median household income. So once again, getting back to the point I raised earlier, this could be an opportunity. Yes, certainly based upon the current, based on these calculations, you see a lot of red, but it's, it's better to know that you've got housing that's not overvalued, has not been appreciating as much as the county as a whole, and you've got a housing stock for the most part that's fairly stable. So you've got real opportunities to preserve that housing stock and potentially create some additional housing stock that would be affordable. On the renter side, um, as you can imagine, uh, based upon that, that, that median gross rent of 1019 and 1143 for the county, you can see fairly large gaps on a monthly basis for extremely low, very low, and low income households, and a small, uh, and a small surplus uh, when it comes to uh, that price uh, for moderate income and middle income households. But, but that's the census, uh, that's the median gross rent based upon the most recent census data I had showed you earlier based upon a, a more current uh, rental analysis that is closer to probably 1,500 for two bedroom. This is all rental units, so it's one bedroom efficiency, so that's gonna lower the, the median gross rent. But typically when you're looking at uh, the median gross rent in any community, you wanna look at a typical two bedroom, and in this case, the 109, one, 1019 is obviously, uh, you know, for, for all the housing, all the rental housing in one, uh, in one big box. Okay. Um, some of these points I, I, I was uh, referring to earlier uh, and, and through, the, through the presentation, but when we begin to think about what types of um, housing revitalization strategies the CRA could, could, could consider and begin thinking about in terms of creating the priorities that Rasha had mentioned, we, we need to be thinking once again of not just the housing relative to, you know, what's affordable, but, but how does this relate to the economy, the, the economy of the CRA? What is it you're trying to accomplish in terms of revitalizing the CRA, making the CRA, uh, improving the quality of life, not only for current residents, but for future residents, 
and certainly families and grand grandchildren. Well, the most obvious way to do that is, is through the greater use of mixed use development, which creates the jobs on, on one hand, the jobs that those 22,000 people, 22,000 people leave the city for each day, uh, begin to target those kinds of occupations, those kinds of businesses, and, and then use the, 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 the mixed, your mixed use, which you've already got on the books. But I, from my, uh, when, when I looked at your mixed use uh, 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 land use, uh, regula land development regulation, um, I believe you're limited at, even at the high end at 45 units per acre. Is that right, Raj? I believe it's 45 units per acre. In certain oh, locations, yeah. but yeah. 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 we minimize our density in the city, and that's the problem I think in a lot of our yeah. redevelopment. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. So, and and it's not something. And it, it, think about mixed use, and and we, we work in a lot of cities about about this. Um, this very issue is is it really needs to be targeted. I mean, to to specific locations, and and a lot of it comes back to what. We, a lot of the things we already talked about, not not just in terms of the affordability aspect of it, but the mix the mix of the project that you're trying to do, whether you go vertical or horizontal. Well, I think for the most part, you can do both here in in in, uh, in North Miami. But you want to be able to target the industries, target the target the types of businesses, um, create the types of housing, not just the affordability levels, but the types of housing. That would attract those workers, those that those twenty-two thousand are leaving, or the, or the uh, <coughs> eleven thousand that that are coming in, uh, and and then of course we want to even up those numbers because eventually, if your economy can grow, you create even greater demand for business and uh, greater demand for housing. So it's 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 one thing to have mixed use on the books in your land development regulations or in your future land use uh, um, element. But to really think through in terms of the really the types of projects, because then you can begin to think of the tailor the incentives to developers to do that, do, do precise, precisely what that is. So it's not just some generic mixed use development. It's a mixed use development that targets certain business types, certain housing types at certain and different price points. Now, in your research, you obviously looked at the zoning map yeah. with the density limitations and so forth yeah. and so on. Do you have any recommendations to that? Or uh, we, we didn't recommend that. That, that wasn't, you know, that's something. But we, but we did look at them, and that's why I mentioned that. That I think there's a, there's more you could do, uh, but I, I would never recommend just like a lot of cities do. They just they just plop, you know, mixed use in, into their land development regulation because everyone else is doing it, or other types of. But uh, we have that right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I, I, I think, and, and what I what I talk about, what I recommend, what we recommend in, in the study is to really focus in on certain locations, whether it be in the downtown, on Dixie, uh, on Dixie Highway for sure, uh, and, and begin to think about it once again in terms of who's going to live there, what types of businesses would these be, uh, could people then live in these projects, uh, uh, live in the surrounding neighborhoods that are already out there, walk to these types of businesses in the downtown or on Dixie Highway or wherever. Um, you know, and so it become, it's become not just targeted, but almost tailored, tailored to the types of businesses and the types of working <coughs> residents that, that you well. either have now or want to continue to bring into the city. Do we know how many of the people that uh, actually work at, say, Johnson & Wales yeah. um, or SIU, um, how many of the people that work there live here? None. Yeah. 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 Not specifically. Yeah, and they would, they would probably love to work here and live here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's uh, the way we have it set up, unfortunately, is we minimize our height, we uh, minimize our density, and uh, it's like chasing a tail. We've been doing this a long time. Oh, for I mean, years, that's for years. Yeah. I mean, we've been like being uh, studies on Sixth Avenue, studies on the West Side, and we're just, you know, we're saying the same thing. Yeah. We agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Change the, the, uh, Take a look the at density the and the height. And, and, and it hasn't gone anywhere. Well, just just to say, um, 
I remember when they were doing the LDRs and the comp plan uh, mm -hmm. for 7th Avenue. So on the east side, you can go up to 20 stories, 200 feet, but it was strictly commercial. And that's what the district commission councilman wanted. Um, last month, it was last month, right? We changed that. They did a text yeah, amendment. They yeah. just changed it mm -hmm. to mixed use. Mixed use yeah. You can do residential, commercial, and retail. Um, they sent it to, was it Tallahassee or wherever that office is, so we're waiting for it to come back, and then it's going to be yeah. right on second reading. So that's a little positive nudge for the west side, for, you know, but you Northwest know, 7th when Avenue. When you start to think as much traffic as you have on 7th Avenue, mm -hmm. you really do not have anything attractive on 7th mm -hmm. Avenue. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean only North Miami, mm -hmm. but you take 7th Avenue all the way. The corridor itself. Yes, it's awful. Yeah. It really, yeah. and it's such a, a, a travel uh, street yeah. that you should have more. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, w one thing I didn't mention, uh, we lost somehow here. But you're, you're gonna put, it, put back the slide, Junior, please? Okay. Um, the other, one of the advantages that, that a lot of workers are looking at right now uh, is, is, is obviously not to be able to have to drive each, each morning. So you, we know you're losing 22,000 uh, each morning. Um, and we know they're driving at least 30 minutes, so they're, they're going somewhere else in Miami Day to or South Broward, probably. Um, your, but even with that, your housing and transportation cost index, I, I think it's something you may have heard that term before, mm -hmm. where you actually uh, combine housing costs with transportation costs. Mm -hmm. um, the housing piece, as, as you know, it should not be more than 30%. Mm -hmm. Based upon this new index, what the index has actually been around for a little while now, uh, you should not be paying more than 15% of your household income on transportation costs. So you put those together, the threshold should be no greater than 45%, right? You're at about uh, 53%. So you're above it, above that threshold, 53%. But the county is around 62%. Mm. So obviously, you're benefiting right now mm -hmm. from the fact that you are east and you're not out in Doral, you're not out in Kendall, you're not out in some of these other places. Yeah. But if you could improve upon ask. that, <laughs> if you can, that would be a that would be an incredible marketing tool to say that, that that the city of North Miami has an HDT index of under 45, which you could do be if you could create more downtown businesses mm -hmm. and, and, and create the housing together with the businesses. What a marketing tool, you know, that that you've done that you've accomplished this. Get yeah. people out of their cars. One of our planners has suggested years ago a compact urban center. Scheme. Yeah. This came more water in the track. And the Urban Land Institute work, live, and play in the same neighborhood. And density is good. It's yeah. energy. It, it, it's yeah. right there. And when you have that, you have a tax base. You have yeah. people with That's disposable right. income. And therefore, you could build on the other side of that with that tax base. You could build a heck of a lot more affordable houses. That's right. But you, when you, 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 but you have to have it. And, and for some reason, we can't get the density increased because we're just, we're just stymied out there. Yeah. And that's that's the what I see, and I've been on this game a long time in the city. That's where I see the, the issue, the height and the density. Yeah. The, and there's just one area of this city that fights it completely. Oh, no, we don't want that. Oh, we don't want to look like Aventura. Well, you know what? Then it's an issue right there. Well, you know, and, and, and it is going to be a part of it is, is selling it, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you, if you, you've probably been trying to do that for a long time. Yeah. But, but targeting it, I mean, Dixie Highway should be that type of uh, corridor. But that <laughs> level, that, that type of density. They're, they're parkers in your downtown that really need that. Mm -hmm. if, if, uh, I guess what, what I'm saying here in, in part of our recommendations, because one of the next, um, uh, one of the other recommendations we're going to come out with is a, is a neighborhood enhancement program. If we can reassure some of the single family residents that live just south of us here and north of us here, that we're going to enhance their neighborhoods through home ownership stabilization, through mm -hmm. and, and other ways that we can up up the home ownership rates in those neighborhoods. Then maybe they'll be less concerned that we're trying to create a little higher mm -hmm. density right on 125th and and Dixie and places like that. Um, you know, and and a lot of it's just it, it's people have an idea of density as being something awful. They need to see it. They need to understand what it looks like. And, and how it fits into the existing uh, um, scale of, of the city, particularly along these corridors and some of these other targeted locations. 
Um, the other issue there is, you know, having been doing this for a long time, I, my background, as I said, is you know, economic development. I used to be a planning and development director for years. Is, and you may, you may know this, getting developers to build mixed use is hard <coughs> because you have your residential developers and you've got your commercial developers, you've got your retail developers. Uh, <coughs> this was an issue when we did the study for Midtown Miami some years ago. And, and it was very difficult because we realized that developers were coming to the table. You either had your big residential developers or you had your commercial developers. Everybody had the people who built offers, hotel. everybody has their specialty. So that's something that, that the city is going to have to work with to, to get um, uh, developers in here to understand that. And, and, and maybe they need to know that it's something that, it is, that, is, that will be supported by the city. That Bring in a team. I mean, it, you know, there's no reason to talk to a residential, a strictly residential developer, mm -hmm. or a ta low income tax credit developer, mm -hmm. when you want to create retail and jobs and, and other types mm -hmm. of offices. Right. You, you, that's part of the challenge that we have today is putting together the development the team, team. Yeah. Who, who can make those projects happen and be the model, mm -hmm. be the model for the city and, and other locations. Dania Beach is doing that right now uh, with fast. their downtown. Because they have, they have an old downtown, much like yours, mm -hmm. as you know, right on uh, US 1. But they want to create something that's much more mixed use. So I, I wanted to also um, mention the reason why Mr. Sambalat, the city's economic development manager, is here is, you know, because we're having this discussion. But he did get a grant, correct me if I'm wrong, a federal grant to do a, a target industry study. Mm -hmm. And it's out to bid. And that's to specifically yeah. help us. <coughs> Sorry. Hi, it's Sam Blatt, Economic Development Manager for the city. Yeah, the study that we're working on now is actually going to complement the housing study very effectively because it's going to actually look at our C1 districts, which is our commercial districts that allow actually for light industrial, which includes Northwest 7th Avenue, West Dixie Highway, um, the areas that Dr. Murray was saying really need to have this mixed-use development, but we're going to be looking into what are the target industries that our city should be focusing on attracting by doing a similar type of analysis, which is looking at our commercial inventory, what's the age of that, what is available, what's our competitive advantage, and then trying to go out and actually getting a strategy to attract those businesses to our city. So we right now are having the RFP committee review the different proposals, and we should have them starting by next month. Okay. So this is a grant that he applied for yeah, and he got. Yeah, it's funded from the Economic Development Administration, the EDA, through so. the Department of Commerce. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more? Yeah, in fact, we'll we'll share with you we just we just completed a target industry study for the city of Delray Beach. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll share that with you because I think there's a lot of the same industries you might want to take a look at. Um, I lost the PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Last one. I think it's oh, the last there we page. Go. It okay. is the last page. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, where's she coming? Um, the, the second one is is also uh, it, it really kind of goes with the first uh, bullet in some in some ways, but um, but it's more it, it, it's okay. more specific to. Um, uh, multi uh, multi-family housing that is mi of mixed income. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and you know this, a lot of the if someone's building affordable housing today, multi-family affordable housing, it, it's it's low income tax credit, which obviously is for households earning 60 percent or less than the AMI. No one's building anything in between, <laughs> so you're either getting you know 60 percent or under, or you're getting high-end rental housing. We need to figure out how to create high-quality mixed income housing where you especially at where we were missing that 61 percent to 120 and there's no reason we can't do that and do it in a way that that's really quality i think that's part of the problem sometimes is people begin to think of um, lower income housing or workforce housing as something that's less desirable well no there's no reason why that shouldn't complement what you're trying to do in terms of mixed use in fact you could have whole buildings just dedicated as part more of a horizontal mixed use type of development area uh, to accommodate more quality, you know, mixed income kind of development. Um, 
in, in Europe, they do it all the time. I mean, they, they, have, uh, they have high-end housing mixed in with workforce housing and everything in between. <coughs> you say in Europe they have it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very common. Because they have so little land to work with because cities are so, the countries are so small to begin with. Uh -huh. So their urban areas, you take an Amsterdam or, or a place like that, Vienna, they have to provide for their workers. If they oh, yeah. don't, they're in trouble. When you hear workforce housing, well, what, what, what I, is that a fancy name? Yes, it is. And, and, and <laughs> that's what we're going, it's a fancy name. And yeah. when people think of that, they start thinking of all the projects in New York City. Yeah. Or Cabini Green in Chicago. Yeah. yeah. And you start thinking of that, and you yeah. think, well, is that what, what I want? And yeah. I, I've seen projects up in uh, Illinois and Chicago which is workforce housing, but like you said, quality workforce yep. housing. And I, and I mean, yep. it was really first class, yep. sharp stuff. Yep. And you know, like when we talk on the planning commission, okay, you want to build a workforce house, all right, there's no reason why you can't have a pool on a roof and proper amenities, yep. which the surrounding neighborhood would appreciate. And this is all part of the evolution, which for some reason here, Mike, and you know it, you and I, it looks like spinning our wheels. I mean, I want to yep. see that happen. Yeah, I, I agree with Raj and, and, and Sam. You know, this is, we got to move it. But I, yeah, quality yeah. workforce. Yeah, and I agree. I, I we throw these terms around, and 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 people have have their own definition of them. But when, but in reality, I, I grew up in factory housing. My, my dad worked in a factory, and and the, and the owners of the factory built quality yeah, housing for their workers. And guess what? You could walk to work from the housing, yeah, yeah. which was very common up north. Where I grew up in probably in the mid, upper Midwest because you had yeah, uh, either factory housing or called mill housing, but it was fairly good housing, pretty solid housing. Um, but we need to understand. I mentioned earlier you have a, you have a labor participation rate of sixty over sixty one percent. We need to be creating housing for that sixty one percent of your population. Very Dutch, those are your workers. Work. So look, I've been using the term more working residents. The working residents of North Miami. That's who we're trying to. That's who we're trying to address. It should be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Anybody have any questions? No, I think we. No, the presentation was great. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, to recommend uh, approval. To recommend approval of the report and the recommendation. Make the motion. So moved. Okay. Second. 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 Any further Third. discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. We'll see you on Excellent. Tuesday at 5:30, Dr. Murray. Hmm? We'll see you on Tuesday at 5:30. For the, board. Yeah, for the board, for the board. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. All right. Um, I don't think there's any c a report from the CRA attorney, because, <laughs> which is good. Um, under the executive director's report, um, past pa past page 111, I think you'll see our annual report by state statutes. We are required to have an annual report for the past activities of what we did. Um, I know. Um, Got to keep scrolling. The, um, IT will next time do it properly for the prompts. But if you go to page, yeah. there you go. Yeah, All right, this is our annual report. This is the booklet. Um, by state statute, we have to have it available by March 31st on our website. We will be advertising it in a public notice, the Miami Herald. It has already be been submitted to the county, which is one of our taxing authorities. Um, we will be making about 200 of these booklets. This is what we use when we go to these conferences, these economic development conferences, ICSC, and also for developers to know what we've been doing. And we do intend, Gail worked very hard on this because she wants to try to apply to get another award. So I just have to give her the plug. Um, so again, we've met our requirement. We've done everything we're supposed to do. And if you have the time, thank you so much, Mr. Jatsi. On page 12, you can see the comparison of the commercial grants that we've been giving out and how we've leveraged private investments for the commercial um, grants. What is it, 57% is private? Um, they're matched, and 43% is CRA investments into these commercial grant programs. So I just wanted to mention that. You can read it at your leisure. It's on our website, and once we print the hard copies, I will have some for you to share. Um, Lost City Brewing Company, I needed to give you an update because, I'm sorry. There's no budget. The annual report? Yeah. No, it's just an annual report. Okay. Um, it's in summary. Four pages. Yeah, I know. No, but it's not a budget. It's the annual report is not four pages. <laughs> it's a, it, yeah, we don't um, submit it for approval. It's just a, a, an activity of, it's a report of all of our activities. So um, anyway, 
part of the grant agreement that we did with Lost City Brewery uh, per Councilman Galvin and Councilman Bienname was they needed to provide quarterly updates as to where they are. Um, they finally got out of Durham and they submitted their paperwork and it's with um, CPND for yeah. review. Same thing for Descarga. The reason why Lost City got out sooner is because they were sharing and they got all the information from Descarga as to their challenges dealing with Durham and the um, WASD and all that stuff. Remember, we're converting warehouses into breweries. So that alone was a back and forth in comments. So the good news is the plans are in the city now. So once the CPND is done reviewing and with their comments, they should be getting their permits next week to start construction. This Gargar has already received their barrels from China. They're in the warehouse and everything. It's just we need them to finish up the work so we can open up. Um, in terms of the Griffin Center design that we had presented to you last month, we are trying to have a community workshop mid-April. Um, but looking at the schedule, it's very busy. Like especially mid-April, you have all these homeowner association meetings, a library meeting, and so on. So we're going to try to find something that's not, you know, too busy, and we'll make sure that you all are all notified, especially you, Miss Couch, because we've talked about you know what you would like to see, and you, Mr. McDermott, because I know you work with the people, the JCs, and so on and so forth. So we are trying to schedule it. Lastly, Mr. Each, you were not there. We will not be having a meeting for the month of May because of elections. Election day is May 14th. Um, swearing in would be May 28th. And if there's a runoff, it goes into June, and then we may not have a meeting in I'll June. I'll be out of town on so, May 24th. So um, for sure, for sure, we don't have a meeting in May. Okay. I will keep you posted for June. And if you don't have a meeting in June, then we will see you in July um, with a very heavy agenda because then we recess for August and so on and so forth. Okay, so those were my only comments and report for today, unless you have any. Okay, thank you very much um, for the uh, uh, report on the study last time. Very interesting. Thank you, Karen, for your participation. Um, is there any old business to come before us? No. Any new business? No. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you. Aye, 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 aye. Thank you.